On behalf of the Computer History Museum, I would like to welcome Dr. Alam Kal Tampi Thomas for his oral history interview. My name is Uday Kapoor and I'm a volunteer at the museum. I have the added privilege of being a long-term, since 1975, acquaintance of Dr. Thomas. He has a PhD and an MS in electrical engineering from Stanford University and is a well-known <coughs> well entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. He is no most known for his contribution to microprocessor pipeline architecture, specifically as the founder of next-gen microsystems. Of course, there are many more things to talk <laughs> about, but this is just a brief introduction. So with that, we can start uh, with you. your early life. And uh, tell us, uh, I, I read that you were born in um, Cochin in Kerala in India in 1946 on April 11th. Uh, so with that, maybe you can tell us about your childhood. Well, I grew up in, uh, in Cochin. Um, my, um, my father uh, represented the area, uh, area of Cochin in India's first parliament. And uh, there was even an interesting backstory on it in the, um, he was the first one uh, in his family to go to, go beyond high school for generations. And, uh, and the backstory was his father was a, what in America we would call a dirt farmer. You know, he had, he farmed enough to feed the family, but they didn't have much uh, extra cash. So, um, in those days, and the, I think even now in India, it, you know, going to college is not an expensive thing, except you have to go to a, a different town and you have to pay for the room and board and so on. So he decided that he wanted to go to law school. And, um, and his, his father did not have any money to send him away to another town. So he went over to his mother, uh, his grandmother, and said he wanted to go to law school and he needed some money. And um, the grandmother must have figured he's a smart person, driven person. And so the grandmother said, well, I don't have any money, but I have my wedding gold jewelry that I can give it to you and you can take it to the bank and they'll give you money for that. So that's how he went to law school. And he was a subject of the Maharaja of Cochin when he was growing up. Um, uh, he was a very successful lawyer. He became um, the, uh, the lawyer to the Maharaja. And then when India became independent, uh, he represented that area, which was really the Maharaja's kingdom, the, the, the area, Koch, the state of Cochin. And so it was a, a, a strange uh, reversal in the sense that now all of a sudden the Maharaja became his, his constituent and he, was, he represented the Maharaja as a, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the parliament. And then he went on to serve in Nehru's cabinet and very very successful person. But I always remember that, uh, you know, is um, how much uh, education does for, a, you know, to bring a family from, uh, from wherever they are to the next level up. And uh, so it's something that I always believe in and, and try to help people in, in that area. And, and then I went to, uh, uh, Engineering College in uh, Pilani, Berlin. So let's come back to that. Yeah, uh, Berlin let's Institute start of Technology. From, uh, you know, so you mentioned that your father served in Harris cabinet. What was his role there, and what he was the, uh, initially was the, the minister for uh, food and agriculture, mm -hmm. and then in 1962, um, Nehru replaced uh, Krishna Menon after the. Uh, Indo-Pakistan, I mean China-Pakistan China, war, yes. China-Indo-China in, war, and uh, so he became the minister, junior minister for Nehru, because Nehru ran the defense ministry at that time. So he was the minister of state for, for defense. Okay. okay, very nice to know that. Uh, so let's go back to 
Um, so you were born in Cochin, so your parents had lived in Cochin, I assume. Their parents lived in Cochin, but they moved to Delhi. Um, and my mother decided that uh, uh, my brother and I should uh, uh, go uh, grow up, uh, should go live with my grandfather, my mother's father, who had a, a cashnut estate. And he also grew lemongrass. So uh, those were the, uh, I guess, the cash crops. Uh, and then he had rubber also. Uh, that. So that was about uh, 25 miles outside Cochin, uh, in, up in the hills. And so we, I did my high school in the local village high school. Uh, and it was, it was sort of a, a, a strange situation because uh, I had no idea how good I was or anything. And uh, so in the fine school, SSLC they call it, which is school secondary school leaving certificate. Um, I came second in the state among 100,000 kids or something like that. So that's, a, that's the first time it occurred to me that, you know, that I was reasonably bright. And, uh, but I always wanted to do engineering and I went to Pilani, uh, Birla Institute of Technology and Science. Um, in uh, the north of Delhi. And uh, the Pilani, I did not have the math background uh, to do the IIT entrance exam. But Pilani was great because they admitted you based on your grades. And so, and it was also a great school. It had collaboration with MIT. We had a lot of professors from MIT teaching at Pilani. And uh, when I finished, uh, my undergraduate in electric, electrical engineering. Um, I got admission to Stanford, so I came here in 1968. And okay, so <clears throat> again, going, <coughs> excuse me, going back to the uh, school days, uh, you said you lived in uh, near Cochin, uh -huh. right? So the school was in Cochin? Or? No, it was 20 miles away 20 from miles. in a village, in, okay. a, in a small village, That's there were amazing. not uh, so that I ha I did not have any anybody in a, in a role model sense. Uh, yeah. of <coughs> that was my question. Yeah, my classmates. Yes. It, they were so you actually were a loner in that sense that you you were self made. In one in, in, in the, yeah, only because you know my first experience in a, in an interesting way of learning from the peers was uh, when I came to Stanford because. You know, I, I always stood first or second in the class without trying very hard. You know, you just wrote your exam and, you know, when the time came, you are either first or second. And, and then it, it occurred to me that everyone at Stanford came first or second in their classes. So that was really the, the, the very first experience I have in, in terms of your peers, how good they are and how much you learn from them. And uh, that, that is a, uh, I think that is a uniquely American experience. Uh, the, the top schools here, uh, you know, sort of prepares you for the, for the next level better than uh, anybody else. So in terms of your school days, uh, were there any favorite subjects that you had? And in fact, how did you transition towards electrical engineering or engineering? Um, Do you have any favorite teachers or? No, I think, um, no, my favorite teacher was uh, really uh, the person who taught me grammar. And, uh, and, and I kind of like grammar, even though I couldn't put two sentences together properly, but I knew how it was structured. And uh, it was sort of a math uh, behind it. Um, in, uh, mathematics was, was a favorite subject of mine. And, uh, and electrical engineering, um, I think in India, when you decide to go to an engineering school or whatever, uh, it's very different than in the States. I mean, you don't, uh, you kind of do what what is the most popular 
topic at yeah, that time. You're saying exactly what I went through, but uh, yeah. I just wanted you to say that. And you know, because um, I think in Pilani, um, you know, it went through the normal uh, progression in India. The, all the smart ones in the early days did civil engineering because that's all the, you know, you had all the public works department right. jobs. And it used to be mechanical engineering. Was then also it became mechanical engineering right. after that. And then by the time I, it was electrical engineering. And uh, so, so that's what, uh, that's what I did. But I did a very um, traditional uh, electrical engineering, um, power generation, distribution, transmission, and so on. So, so it was a big shock to me uh, when I came to Stanford because they didn't have any ele electrical engineering. So did Pilani have electronics? Uh, uh, they had electro They had telecommunication at that, not electronics okay. per se. Um, and they had a course uh, in control theory. Um, and I had taken that course. So when I came to Stanford, there was no uh, electrical engineering that I learned in Pilani back at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, but I r sort of recognized the control theory. So I said, oh, that's where I'm going to do my PhD. In. And um, fortunately for me, or unfortunately at that time, um, they gave me uh, Professor Kalman as my thesis advisor. And uh, so I had my first meeting with him, it took about an hour, an hour and a half. And after I left the meeting, I, I just realized I didn't, understand a single thing he told, talked to me about, because it was so heavily mathematical. And, and in, in India, when you do engineering, you tend to do a lot less of the, of the advanced mathematics. It's more the applied, applied things. So I decided that I'm not going to cut it in control theory, so, or system. Uh, Stanford, it was called uh, systems theory. And, uh, and I know you interviewed uh, uh, Professor Kailath, and he had just joined Stanford, and he was the youngest professor uh, at Stanford at that time. He was 24 or 25 or something like that. And um, so I decided that I better either go back and do all the math courses, or if I want to continue on my path, uh, do something that I was on the same level as everyone else. and. Uh, and so it was, what was interesting was all uh, digital courses were graduate level courses at that time. They were, in, in, in Stanford terms, they were all 300 level courses. So I figured that I'm on the same level as anybody else. So I switched over to um, computer engineering and digital systems. So that's how I ended up in, into the computer. So again, going back to your early days, um, <clears throat> I know that um, you were born in the, in the Syrian Christian uh -huh. uh, tradition. Uh, how was that for you in terms of in a country where that was not the dominant uh, culture or religion, yeah. at least what uh, way I look at it? Yeah. In, in, in Kerala, unlike the north of India, um, there was really no religious strife at all. Um, and also because of Cochin, which was a, uh, a natural port, and it was on the trading route between the Middle East and China, um, and because Kerala was where all the spices were grown in India. So the trade route was people would come from uh, the Middle East uh, with spices and dates and nuts and pistachio, and they would trade that for uh, coffee and tea and spices uh, in Kerala, and then they will take it to China, and then they will trade it for silk and ceramic in China, come back and trade some of the silk and ceramic for more spices, and then go back to Middle East. So, uh, and that trade uh, had existed for before Christ. And, and so Kerala was interesting in the sense that three great religions in India entered India through Kerala. Uh, Christian, Muslims, uh, because of people from Middle East had come, uh, the Jewish uh, religion, and, and the Christians. And, uh, and even now in Cochin, there is a synagogue. 
uh, which is the oldest synagogue outside the Middle East. And there's a very small uh, Jewish population, most of them when they went uh, to Israel. And so, so when we grew up, there was no, uh, what you call, no ghettos per se. I mean, Christian Muslims and Hindus all lived together. Uh, there were temples, mosques, and churches all together. And, and in the morning, you'll have a cacophony of sounds um, that, you know, Im that came from all these religious institutions, the church bells. And Actually, I experienced that uh, a few years ago when I went to Kerala. So yeah. you're absolutely right. So, so it is, uh, and, and that, those religious experiences really um, sort of keeps Kerala apart from from rest of India in a, in a in an interesting way because uh, the Christians really introduced uh, education to the women, so you have a situation in India all the women are educated. I mean now you are close to hundred percent literacy rate in Kerala, and 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 there is an interesting byproduct of that which is Kerala is the only state in India uh, which has the boy girl ratio the natural ratio, uh, because the, the women being educated, they will not let their girl babies to be aborted. And, and so, so I think, I think lot, the, the, the Christians left a, uh, left a big mark uh, in India. And, and the tradition is that a um, lot of the Christians who were initial, initially converted there were uh, Hindus and there were Brahmins, and and they were in the services of the Maharaja, and the Maharaja really didn't feel he looked at the trade uh, as as a good thing, and so there was never any conquest of either the uh, Muslims or the Jewish or the Christians of Kerala. They just came to do trade, and uh, so there was no conflict, and. Um, so the early Christians uh, were treated really well, um, and they didn't have any trouble living within the Brahmin community uh, because they ki kind of considered themselves as e equivalent to the Brahmins. Uh, yeah, they were educated. Um, and like my, ra my father, who is a Christian, uh, the Maharaja had no trouble having him as his lawyer, so to speak. I see. Um, Very good. Um, in terms of your family, uh, life, you had a brother with you that you were with the grandparents uh -huh. in the early days, and then how often did you folks travel to meet your parents in Delhi? Or? You did that once a year during summer vacation, okay. and it was a four-day train journey. It was very similar to what I went through. Yes, so, uh, yes. It was a four-day train journey, so we spent uh, three months there, uh, and then, not three months, two months actually, and then came back to Kerala. Okay, okay. Um, so let's now go forward. Uh, you mentioned um, your selection of Pilani uh, uh, for the reasons that you mentioned and the education you got there. How did you choose Stanford? Uh, you know, were you looking at different schools or why did you select Stanford for your graduate schools? Uh, so the, the three schools I applied to were uh, MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley. And uh, Berkeley because um, at that time, people may not sort of realize that now, every department in Berkeley was better than every department at Stanford, definitely in engineering. Well, Stanford maybe the exception was in system theory and in semiconductors. Uh, but Stanford did not, did not have any traditional electrical engineering at that time. Um, they, prob they didn't even have traditional mechanical engineering. They had aeronautical engineering. And uh, so I got into both Berkeley and Stanford, and um, there is a, a, a funny story how I ended up at Stanford. Um, this was in uh, uh, compute, uh, TV had just come to India. So this was 1968, and there was the free speech movement and uh, so the so there were uh, my mom was watching the tv and it was all over you know the free speech movement was a big news item all, all, all over the world at that time 
and um, she saw, um, you know, the the flower girls in in Berkeley and so on. And she became convinced that uh, if I went to Berkeley, that I would never come back come back to India. So. Then uh, I thought about it, and I said, OK, I'll go to Stanford. And so she was against me going to Berkeley for no rhyme or reason other than the, uh, the women that she saw on TV. And, uh, and she kind of liked Stanford uh, for two reasons. One is uh, it was not Berkeley. And the second one, uh, which is probably equally important, it sounded like Oxford. So she thought it must be a must be a good good university. That's how I ended up at Stanford. So in those days, uh, as you had once mentioned, and as I know, uh, we did not get much uh, money to bring with us from India. No, you had, uh, yeah, government of India, we did not have any foreign exchange. That's right. So there was, uh, I think we all came here with, uh, with $40. So and did you have a scholarship or? Yes, I had, but but all you had at that time was forty bucks in your pocket, right. and then um, and then also I did not know um, where Stanford was. You know, you assume that Stanford was in San Francisco, uh, or Berkeley was in San Francisco, and all the planes landed at two in the morning, and uh, so I had arranged. Uh, for to stay at the YMCA in San Francisco on Golden Gate. And so I caught a Greyhound bus and uh, come to YMCA. This was late August. And I uh, had no idea San Francisco would be a cold place. But it wasn't cold. It was one of those nice August uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, nice and warm. Um, and uh, so I come to the YMCA at three in the morning, and um, the the person tells me that uh, uh, it will be seven dollars or something for the day, and so I have now I have thirty eight bucks in my pocket, uh, the two bucks for the Greyhound. So I'm now thinking that. So I asked him when does the day start, and he said, well, six in the morning. So now I'm calculating that three so for three hours. I had to, um, you know, I had to spend another seven bucks. So I asked him if he would keep my suitcase and uh, where the nearest park was. So he pointed me to Union Square. And so the very first night in America, I slept on a bench on Union Square. And my <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it, it's a good thing I didn't know. And it wasn't cold. But you know, if you didn't know any better, San Francisco could get pretty cold during the summertime. Yeah. And so the next day I took the Greyhound back to Stanford. Then, you know, then Stanford is a, such a uh, welcoming and accommodating place. You, you already have a host family and, you know, you, you, you become part of the community and so it is, it is very yes. easy. Yes, very nice. Yeah. So you did have a scholarship. Yeah. And so very good. That's excellent. So in terms of, um, what are your memorable experiences at Stanford? I mean, of course, you mentioned how you selected the subject. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts? My memorable experiences were first. I, I sort of mentioned earlier about dealing, you know, just just interacting with my peers. You know how bright they were, and how much um, how much interest they had in studying. You know, in India, I, it sounds bad when you say we had really no interest, that much interest in knowledge per se. I mean, you just want to study the subject material so you can do well in the exam. So that was the, the driving force. And, and you, uh, you come to Stanford, um, you know, the driving force was really knowledge and interacting with the professors and so on. And my uh, most memorable uh, uh, professor, even though I did not know him that well, um, was Professor Kanuth, who taught uh, algorithms. And he was just an amazing teacher. And he had this system where at the, at the very first lecture, he will tell you 
that if you can find a mistake in his textbook, you get an A and you don't attend classes again after that. So that was a driving force for, for everyone. At least two or three uh, classmates of mine uh, sort of uh, got out of continue, you know, doing the entire course because they found a mistake in the, in the textbook. So that, 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 you know, for me, that whole experience that a, a professor can do that, you have the flexibility to, uh, in India, you know, you never have that flexibility. You, you, you have a fixed way of doing things. So this whole experience of uh, driving for knowledge or striving for knowledge, um, the, the professors, having the freedom, you know, the whole concept of freedom. I mean, in this case, there was also, you know, there was a physical concept of freedom because this is the first time I was on my own, you know, my parents were not around and, and I was making an assistantship, so I was financially independent, so to speak. So there was that sense of freedom, but this sense of freedom in a, in a learning environment and what you can do, uh, that was a, that was an amazing experience. Yeah. So, uh, you did your master's first, uh, yeah. and then you decided to go for the PhD. Uh, was there a different decision in that? Yeah, it was a very different decision. Uh, and uh, when I when I finished my master's, I was uh, or halfway through my master's. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be a student of Ed Davidson and uh, who had just got his PhD from Illinois and uh, he was in the digital systems lab. And I was his um, second student at Stanford. Uh, uh, Len Shar was my, his first student. And Len and I then ended up f founding a company together. Um, and uh, and it, it, it was also an interesting experience because somehow you have a, a student-teacher relationship and he was only four years older than me. I was 21, he was 25. And so you have student-teacher and then the fact that you could, be a, you could be friends with him. You know, that's also a very different Unique experience. experience in the U.S. And uh, so I got my master's uh, at the end of the first year. and. Um, you know, you, you're making 300 bucks a month. Um, I sort of recalculated the 300 bucks the other day because uh, it, it sounds so low, but um, my uh, sort of yardstick is when I first came to America, Motel 6 was $6. Uh, that's how the, the day Motel 6 came about. And now, uh, the other day I was driving by the freeway and I noticed that it was sixty nine ninety nine or something. So 70 bucks, so 11 times. So the 300 bucks was really like 3,500 bucks. So it's not that bad, but still. I actually save money with my teaching assistantship. Yeah, so, so, so but I, I really wanted to um, make some money and get some experience. And then something also, uh, sheer, uh, accident of timing that um, both National and Intel had gotten uh, contracts from Japanese calculator companies um, to design calculator chips on contract uh, to them. And uh, National had a contract from Sony to do a calculator chip and Intel had uh, one from uh, Bisicom. And they both decided that um, they may be better off hiring a bunch of people who had computer background and teaching them chip design than the other way around. Because the, uh, I think the number of transistors involved uh, on those calculator chips were 2,000 or, 2, or 3,000. And the state of the art in terms of logic was dual D flip flops, maybe 20 transistors. And so they figured that uh, they would be better off uh, hiring some computer people and, and, and put them together with the chip designers and then do the calculator chip. 
So I ended up in the Sony calculator project uh, at So NASA. you left the MS. I left Na uh, Stanford. Stanford and yeah. joined. And, and then um, uh, Ted Hoff at that time was one year senior to me at Stanford. And he ended up at Intel and on this BCCOM calculator chip. So we had these two parallel calculator chip projects going on. And, and we had, um, it was an enormously complicated project. Intel was doing uh, 1K memory chips at that time, which was the most complicated memory uh, uh, chips. And a 3000 transistor in terms of complexity is even 10 times more complicated than a 1,000-bit uh, memory chip. And uh, so um, we had, uh, we sort of struggled with the with the chip design, both uh, the both at National and later on, I found out at Intel also, and uh, so we were two or three years behind um, uh, the project in terms of delivering it to Sony, and uh, Sony they cared, but they didn't care that much because they had a broad product line. Uh, BCCom. Later on, I found, I found out about it 20 years later, uh, when I met Masashima, who was one of the, he was the designer that BCCOM sent from uh, Japan to work in Ted Hoff's group, along with Fajin and uh, Hoff. And um, the, and he said, uh, uh, BCCOM ended up going bankrupt because they had, bet their entire new product line based on the electronic calculator from Intel. And it was three years behind, they didn't have new products, they just went belly up. And the story I heard from Shima is that they then went to Intel and told them that uh, we cannot afford to pay you the $250,000 in NRE, uh, which is probably two and a half million or three million dollars now. and. Uh, so if you forgive us that, uh, that what we owe you, then we let you have the design because it was a, really a BCCOM design. And uh, so that's how Intel ended up with the fourth, what later on turned out to be the 4004. Four. Yes, uh, very interesting. So uh, after you, uh, for National, when the chip was late, uh -huh. uh, but uh, did you stay at National, or did you decide to then pursue your? Well, then, then I uh, uh, at National. One of the one of the driving constraints for us um, was the participation on the chip, even uh, even two thousand transistors. This is NMOS. NMOS yes. uh, design. Uh, actually, at National it was PMOS. PMOS. Uh, Intel was on PMOS. NMOS, and. Uh, so, and then I um, uh, got introduced to uh, a company called Intracell, and they had a technology called CMOS, and they had a CMOS memory chip, and um, also they had a very clever bunch of engineers who did some of the first analog CMOS design, watch circuits, uh, the Fluke digital voltmeter, uh, amazing design. This is about what time? And this would be 71, 72. Okay. Um, so as I learned more about CMOS and more about Intracell, I got interested that uh, this may be an interesting technology for doing microprocessors because power was becoming a, a big constraint. And, and Intracell had the best CMOS technology at that time. And they were interested in doing, um, expanding their memory product lines to uh, logic design, uh, logic I think product. they were even ahead of uh, RCA. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, and and in, in the, definitely the, the uh, 1K CMOS memory they had was by far the densest CMOS uh, memory chip at that time. Um, and then they had all these, what you call, analog CMOS circuits. And so I, I was uh, started with uh, another person called Shep Hume, 
the uh, digital products line. And uh, so we ended up designing a single chip CMOS microprocessor. And, uh, and we picked the PDP-8 instruction set uh, because we figured that, that there will be a lot of software available so we don't have to do the software uh, for the thing. So we designed the 12-bit PDP-8 at, at, in, at Intracell in, in 1971, um, 72. Uh, it is, uh, and DEC used it for a, for a product, product line that they had. They had a terminal built with, with that. Uh, so you actually ship products. To we ship product. It was a very successful product because that was only low, low power uh, processor available at that time. Um, and so what uh, was the complexity of the chip at that time? It was like, ten, if I remember it right, 10,000 transistors. Uh, and it sort of makes sense because uh, I think the 4004 was uh, 3,000 transistors, and uh, 4 bits, this is 12 bits, so about three times. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, CMOS always took a little more area so that the, the density did not scale as much as the NMOS did. Um, and around that time, um, my training visa had run out, and um, the so the choice was to uh, apply for a green card. But uh, in those days, you had to get a labor certification to get a green card. And this was 1971, 72, big unemployment in the aerospace business, a lot of unemployed engineers, yes. and the labor department doesn't know. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, labor department doesn't know the difference between aerospace engineer and a chip designer. As far as they were concerned, there were a lot of unemployed engineers. So it was, I figured it was almost impossible and to get And then there a, was also the Vietnam War, right. uh, you know, the draft and right. all that. So. So, so, all, so I decided that it was almost impossible to get a labor certification and a green card. So, but I want to stay back in the States. So my only choice was to um, go back to Stanford for my, continue my PhD program. That's how I went back to Stanford in 72, uh, right after the a microprocessor design, and started working for Ed Davidson. And um, then um, in 72, uh, early 72, and in late 72, Diva and I got married. Yeah, and I was going to ask about uh, so, the family uh, side. So she, uh, she arrives in, uh, we came back uh, to India, we got married in India, and uh, we came back in January of 73. So you used to go to India? Uh, I uh, I had made one trip between 68 and 72, one trip in between. And that trip was really to, uh, for a personal reason, my sister decided to marry somebody who was 25 years older than she was. And uh, so, which created a lot of, tension in the family, so I thought I'll go to be, uh, you know, supportive to my sister and my parents. And so I went there in 1970, and, uh, and then I met Deepa accidentally during that trip. Yeah, I was going to ask whether it was an arranged... Marriage. It was arranged, uh, it was sort of, uh, what shall I call it, it was uh, encouraged more than arranged. Uh, so I met Deepa in uh, in that trip in 1970, and uh, this is in uh, Delhi or in, in Delhi. Okay. Um, my parents, uh, my dad was at that time uh, the Indian High Commissioner to uh, Zambia. He had just uh, finished his term in Australia, and he was he was being posted to Zambia. So he was in Delhi, and. Uh, Deva's parents and my parents were really good friends, so they were transiting through, and so Deva's parents came over to see him, see them, and they dragged Deva along. So I, I see Deva for the first time uh, in 1970, and um, during your trip to Delhi, during that trip to for my sister's wedding, yeah. and uh, I sort of quote unquote mistake of 
I made the mistake of asking my mother who she was. I didn't talk to Deepa. I just asked my mother, who was she? And uh, so my mother decided at that time <laughs> that... You were interested. <laughs> yeah, I've fallen in love or whatever, <laughs> maybe. And so my mother and Deepa's mother sort of conspired and her mother, who I, who I knew Deepa's mother too, but Deepa and I had never met before. And mainly because I was away in college and Deepa was away in school and uh, I came home only during summertime and Diva was up in the hills f in a boarding school and her long vacation was during winter. This so is we in Nainital. Yeah, Nainital. Nainital. So yeah. we never crossed paths. And uh, so, but I knew her mother, Diva's mother, so she invited me for lunch and uh, I went there uh, uh, for lunch and, you know, there was this big spread and uh, Deepa's mother uh, told me that Deepa cooked everything. And uh, so now I'm thinking that, well, man, she's not really good looking. She can cook too. And uh, uh, which is probably the only lie her mother ever said in her life. And uh, then I come back um, and we didn't, Deepa and I didn't spend much time. Uh, I come back to Stanford and um, about but you did meet, you did talk, you got yeah. to know her. Yeah, but we didn't go out. Or, I think we did go out uh, to your dinner uh, at a friend's house. and um, But we didn't spend much time um, together. And then I come back <coughs> to Delhi, I mean to Stanford, and um, my mother calls me. Um, she uh, This was 10 days later after I returned. And which was a big occasion because my mother had never called me before uh, in, in the States. Um, at least from States to India at that time was $12. Uh, so I'm sure from India to States was probably the same, same amount of money, which was really a lot of money. And uh, so, so there was, we wrote to each other, but we never, never had a phone conversation. Um, so I pick up the phone and my mother asked me uh, what are my intentions with Deepa and uh, which sort of threw me for a, su a surprise and uh, so I said uh, mom I have I think she's terrific but I have no real intentions in the sense that I can't afford to have any intentions I'm living on 300 bucks and I'm working on my thesis and uh, so my mother tells me that uh, you better have some intentions real quick because Deepa's going to be engaged in another week because there was sort of in background there was a proposal and so on. And I think that's probably my uh, uh, first business instincts came to being. You know, this is sort of a lost business opportunity. I mean, I'm thinking that here is Deepa, she can... She's terrific. She's good looking, great looking. She can cook. And if I don't make the move now, then that opportunity is, is gone. So I called Deepa up, uh, um, a big expenditure, again, 12 bucks, person to person call. Um, and uh, we had this conversation. And first, I asked Deepa whether she remembered me or not. Uh, and that, that got a laugh out of her. And uh, then I asked her if she would marry me. And, uh, and she didn't say, she didn't say no for sure, but she didn't say yes either. You know, she said, she asked me when I was coming back and then I was going through my green card process. So I said, could be another two years, maybe slightly longer. And uh, Deba said, oh, then, you know, when you come back, maybe we should talk. And uh, so then uh, my mother calls again the next day. Um, so that is the second call she made, uh, big expenditure. Uh, and uh, so she asked me, did you talk to Deepa? I said, I did. And she said, what she said. I said, you know, nice conversation. She didn't say anything. We decided maybe we'll write to each other and uh, in two years or whenever I come back to uh, India, we'll take it up again. Um, and 
that was a conversation I had with my mom. And the next morning, uh, she um, ends up at Deva's house with an engagement ring. And she puts it on Deva's finger. And so she's sort of engaged to my mother. And my mother is no more. But um, she also claims that I haven't paid her for the ring, and which is also true, I think. Um, so then, um, so we got engaged, we wrote to each other, and uh, two years later, I got the green card, and then I went back to India and got married. So that was 72. That's amazing, that's an uh -huh. amazing story. So, um, so then after you got married, then Deepa came back with you. Right. So, so then I had started at Stanford in 73, and uh, uh, so I was, I was, then I went back to work at Intracell, um, and um, it was sort of an interesting uh, um, arrangement where, you know, I was not supposed to work during the school year, so, but I worked. And then uh, Joe Risi, my boss at that time, will pay me in the summertime because I'm, I'm, I can work during the summertime. So I didn't have any money for the first nine months, then I got this. But I had an assistantship at Stanford. And um, so, so I was really interested in, in the microprocessor design and uh, uh, very little interest in my, my thesis per se. And only reason I was at Stanford was because of immigration. And, uh, and, and then Ed, um, Ed Davidson was my advisor. Um, he went back to Il Illinois. He was an assistant professor at Stanford. He went back to Illinois as a tenured professor. And uh, so, so he, told, he called Deepa and told her that, um, if Thambi doesn't come with me to Illinois, he will never finish his PhD, which is probably true. And uh, so maybe you should work on him in coming to Champaign, uh, the campus. And uh, so Ed and Deva worked on, so we, went, we ended up going to Champaign. Uh, I was still a Stanford student, but, uh, but Ed Davidson was my advisor. And uh, Stanford was very nice. You know, this is again the flexibility that you have in America. Here is a professor at uh, Illinois uh, managing the thesis for. Uh, yeah. for a, I discovered that in my interview with Tom Callett. Yeah. Where how MIT and the the Lincoln Lab and all the arrangements they had was yeah. amazing. You know, because and he was not a citizen, but doing some design or work in the area where he needed to be a citizen. Yeah. And there is an interesting uh, side story to that because then when I finished my uh, uh, Illinois, you know, I mean, the thing about Stanford is that you are here, it's such a great place to be, and then you can work and you, you're challenged by that. So the thesis was sort of, you know, secondary to, to everything else. And um, uh, whereas at Illinois, that's the only thing you can do. There's nothing else going on in Champaign-Urbana. So, and then I discovered at that time that an average Stanford PhD was four years or five years. An average uh, Illinois PhD is three years because they, they just want to get the hell out of there. And uh, so in six months, I finished my work uh, at Illinois um, and uh, and came back to Stanford uh, because I had finished my work, but I had not written my thesis yet. And so this was in um, 74. And, uh, and I had done my PhD qualifying in 1970. And so in between, so I would have probably never turned in my thesis either because I went back to work and I was enjoying that. And then Stanford put in a new rule at that time that if you didn't finish your PhD uh, in seven years after uh, your PhD qualifying, then you had to qualify again. Uh, 
And the reason they did that was the physics department, the PhDs were taking 14 years, 15 years, because they were using them as slave labor at Slack and so on and so forth. So they put this you know, requirement. And, and I decided that it's been now uh, six or seven years um, after I uh, finished my undergraduate, and all the PhD qualifying is all undergraduate stuff, nothing, yeah. nothing to do with the graduate work. And I was convinced there was no way I would requalify again. And uh, so, so, I had to, so that was a forcing function uh, to turn my thesis in. So I, I didn't, even though I left Stanford in 74, I did not graduate till 77 or something like that. That's when I turned my thesis in. And as part of that, there's a, a, a funny story, which is, um, you know, then uh, you had to defend your thesis. You write to your paper, you know, the, 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 the committee of three or whatever uh, reviews the paper and approves it. But you still have to go through a presentation and an uh, and, uh, 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 interview. And uh, so I was convinced that um, Ed did not have any clout at Stanford because he's now at Illinois. So I'm his, his last graduate student left at Stanford. Um, so I told um, Ed that Ed, you know, I'm really worried because he had no clout here. You know, so uh, what would the other two members think? And uh, Ed, I am sure to make make me feel at ease. He said, "Tambi, there is nothing for you to worry about because." Stanford has to pay my uh, plane fare to come to Stanford f to sit through your exam, and there is no way Stanford will pay it twice in yeah second. So you're guaranteed to pass. So that is that is a you know comfortable thing. But you asked me of all the early on and uh, about the professors. You know Ed Davidson is is probably the person who influenced me most in my life, in my career, my adult life, uh, as a friend, as a professor, and um, as a thesis supervisor. And, and the sweet thing for me is that both companies that I was a co-founder of, Ed was a, a, a consultant or a advisor to the, both those companies. And, and uh, one of my most striking experiences was uh, Ed then went from Illinois to Michigan and he was the head of uh, electrical engineering and computer engineering at Michigan, University of Michigan. And he retired there. And this must have been about 15 years ago. And um, his, um, by that time, Ed had produced 42 PhDs. <clears throat> and his uh, secretary called every one of us and said they were going, they, they want to do a surprise party, farewell party for Ed, and they were calling all his PhD students. And, uh, and 41 of the 42 of us showed up for that. And, and the only reason the other one was missing was he was no more, he had passed away. And so, you know, that says something about the professor, the guide, uh, the mentor that he was uh, to his graduate students. And, and three of us, uh, or four of us, um, ended up in the same computer company that I co-founded uh, in, uh, in 1979. So. Right, that's very nice. So going back to, um, a little bit back to the family side, uh -huh. in terms of your interactions with your parents and brother and you know, Deepa's family, you kept touch with them and and did a lot of things together. Or? Yeah, it it all of it happened after we got married. Uh, uh, first of all, I had the money, and then we could go. So we used to make um, trips every year to India, maybe sometimes uh, twice a year. Uh, so that was that was so we. So there was a gap of about four years, sixty-eight to seventy-two, when I didn't see them except for this one, one short trip to India. And then um, we saw them, we saw my parents and Deepa's parents um, once a year for sure. And so did your father retire after the Zambian? Yeah, he did. Uh, and then 
uh, he had worked for, let me see, the first three prime ministers of India, uh, Nehru, Shastri, and Mrs. Gandhi. And uh, Mrs. Gandhi appointed him. Uh, he worked for her in the cabinet, but also then appointed him as the High Commissioner to Australia, and then later on as High Commissioner to Zambia. And the Zambia, the, uh, the High Commissioner is tend to be a senior person because President Kaunda was one of Nehru's colleagues in the um, uh, non-alignment movement. So they always send a senior person from, from India to there. Unfortunately, I did not have a chance um, to go to uh, Zambia at that time. Um, I was here, but uh, that, that's an experience that I miss. But I made trips to Africa, but not to Zambia. Um, I, you know, we've been to Kenya and, and to South Africa. We made two trips. To right. So, so the other aspect that um, I like to bring up, because I have read about the connection with the Tata family. Uh -huh. So I assume that it was through your father that uh, yeah, it was knew. well, you know, like we we sort of touched on it. Why my mom didn't want me to go to Berkeley because I would never come back, marry one of those girls, and never come back. And uh, um, my father, uh, you know, Tatas had the the reputation of you know in India as as a very straightforward company to work for. They were not very ethical. Very ethical, not corrupt. They were not involved in the politics. They cared for the country. Um, even at that time, um, you know, sixty or seventy percent of the Tata group was owned by the foundation, Tata Trust. Uh, so my father always uh, wanted me to work for uh, for the Tatas. And uh, so he I think talked to J.R.D. Tata once, and um, and Ratan was uh, Ratan had gone back to India. He, he had got his architecture degree at Cornell, and um, so on one of his trips back to the West Coast, I guess, um, J.R.D. told him to go look up Thumby Thomas at Stanford. That's that's when we met. Actually, so we that met was the him first time you met. First time we met. Soon after we got married. Uh, no, maybe not because uh, after we got married, we went to uh, Illinois. Seventy three. So seventy four. Nineteen seventy four was the first time I, I met him. And uh, and I think he went back to India because of. Uh, his grandmother. Uh, family reason. Uh, I mean, his commitment to the family and the, and the Tata group. And uh, I, I think given um, if he had a, a completely free person, he would have probably stayed on uh, be, being an architect. I think that's his real love, so to speak. And uh, so he tried to convince me to come back to India. And I told him that there was really uh, nothing that I could do in India other than be a, a manager, so to speak. And I we could have had a very comfortable life, but not a, a technically challenging thing. And by that time, I got, I got the startup bug. You know, I wanted to do something here. Being in Silicon uh, Valley. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something. I think there is something in the air uh, there. And if, if you are working in Silicon Valley, but if you are at Stanford, there is it in the air at Stanford. You know, and. Um, so uh, I said, you know, I, I would love to do something in India, but I do not. Uh, there is really no opportunity for me there. And then 1979, when we, uh, when uh, when I decided, or when we founded our first uh, company, uh, Alexi, uh, I thought there was an opportunity there. So I went back to the Tatas and said that if we're starting this computer company, and it would be great if they made an investment uh, in, uh, in Alexi here. And J.R.D. Tata was really intrigued by that. And he, um, he made a decision. Uh, I don't recollect exactly how much money they invested, maybe a million dollars or something. And but their entire foreign resource at that time was less than $10 million. Um, 
that was the money they had before India was independent. Because after India became independent, everything came under under the control, and so that was a big commitment uh, for them. And uh, we thought we would uh, set up a joint venture with them in India, uh, and so we decided to do that. And then it became clear that we couldn't do it uh, for two reasons. One is that the government of India will not let us e export that technology. And the government of India will not uh, let you, uh, let Tata's be in that level of computing in India. They had reserved that for the government sector. So we ended up uh, setting up that uh, company in, uh, in Singapore, Tata Alexi is the name. Um, and then so it was set up as Tata Alexi in in Singapore. Yeah, and and I was the uh, I was a co-founder and the VP of engineering at Alexi here, and um, so I had uh, so we got money from the Singapore government to do R and D in Singapore. So we Tata Alexi was the uh, first computer company um, to do any kind of original computer work in Singapore. Including multiprocessing, right? In, uh, let alone multiprocessing, any, any uh, computer work. And, and it's kind of interesting because I know you know this, Intracell was the first semiconductor company uh, to set up an operation in, in Singapore. I think, I think all of that helped uh, because uh, there was a reputation of Intracell and uh, the fact that they had an assembly operation. I still remember you're calling me about Jaggi Tandon, yeah. who had the big operation yeah. in Singapore. That's right, because he was doing uh, disk drives. Disk drives, yeah. And uh, so... Even computers. He was making PCs. Right. Mm. So the government... Uh, so Singapore government gave us, gave us a lot of money, uh, uh, set up a, a big... Uh, gave us land for a big campus there. Uh, the building was designed by Charles Courier. It's still standing, beautiful building. And um, But then I learned um, a sort of a well-kept secret that there are no computer people in Singapore. And so you ended up hiring people from India and Australia and New Zealand and bringing them to Singapore. And And by the time you had the expat salaries and housing allowance and the home leave and so on and so forth. It was, uh, it was more expensive to do anything in Singapore at that level uh, in, in than in California. In my interview with uh, Ratan uh, that I did earlier, uh, he mentioned that Alexi initially grew rapidly yeah. and then the market collapsed. Yeah. So th that the, that there was too many competitors in the right, same domain. Right. Yeah. Um, we, can, we can touch on that when we talk about Alexi. And uh, so, um, so what I decided was uh, that I just don't have the time to manage the engineers in Singapore. So what we s decided, we brought the engineers from Singapore to California as sort of business-to-business -business transfer. And they, most of them ended up staying back here. Um, and they, all, they went on to start other companies and very successful uh, people. And uh, so that then, uh, re jumping ahead, uh, 1992, um, the government of India let uh, Tata's be involved when the, the liberal, liberalization happened the Tatas could get into computers, and then India, India and the U.S. became friendly, and then we could transfer the technology to India. So then Tata LXC moved to, uh, to Bombay, Bombay and Bangalore, and it's doing really well uh, in India. And uh, I got a kick out of uh, reading of all the Tata companies. Uh, they were the best performing company in the last two years in the public market. And so that is kind of nice. So who was, uh, you mentioned you were VP of engineering at Alexi. Who was the president? Uh, Joe Risi was Joe the president. Rizzo, okay. And it was Joe who I worked for yeah, at uh, Intercell. Uh, because yes. see, this was very familiar because I met you when I came back from Germany mm -hmm. and at Intercell. Uh, right. from Eurocell and um, and 
and the idea for Alexei was 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 really interesting in the sense that we did all our simulations uh, during uh, during like mid seventies um, on timeshare machines, and then the Vax seven eighty from DEC got introduced, and that was the first time you could afford a computer, super mini, uh, as as people. Uh, call call it later on uh, that you could run you could afford to have own one of them and run your own simulations and you know as 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 has happened ever since then and that you get a computer you think it is ten times more power than you thought you would use then in ten days it's that saturated happened, that's what happened to them from sun yes. you know that <laughs> the cost came down and the performance yeah. went up right so uh, so we uh, we got the vax 780 uh, we saturated it in about 10 days and at that time um, the 780 uh, it, it took the lead time on it was a year and a half it was $200,000 a lot of money um, but even if you had the 200000 to spend, it took me another 18 months to get a second computer. So, so we started talking about uh, that wouldn't be nice to have a computer where when you run out of computing power, you can plug in another processor and double the power, and, and three and four and five and six and so on. So that's where the idea for LXC came about. Um, it was the first uh, multiprocessor um, computer system in the world. Um, and three of Ed Davidson's students were co-founders. Uh, me, uh, B. Kumar, who was an assistant professor at Stanford, and Len Shar, who was in charge of the HP 3000 operating system um, at, uh, at Hewlett Packard. And uh, and then we decided that uh, uh, to build this uh, multiprocessor system, you need to build it around a bus, and the bus need to be a very high performance bus. And so we went looking for, as a co-founder, a, a bus designer, and we met Mac McFarland, uh, who did the PDP-11 when he was 18 years old. Uh, he was a student of uh, Gordon Bell at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, and I was told that uh, the PDP-11 architecture was Mac's, uh, Mac's paper that he wrote for Gordon Bell. And I think Gordon at that time was also working at DEC. And then he talked back into joining. So Mac never graduated from Carnegie Mellon. Um, I think he was a junior or a sophomore. And he went to DEC and ended up building PDP-11. And, and the Unibus was also the first uniform computer bus, where there was no difference what plugged in. Before that, you always had a processor, and the processor generated a, compu a, a bus, and then you plugged in the peripherals. And, and then there was another bus between the processor and the memory. So there was, if you looked at the block diagrams of computers at that time, there were three blocks. There was a processor uh, and the memory. There's a bus between them and between the processor and the, uh, and the peripheral, there was a bus between them. So there was always a peripheral bus uh, in those days. And uh, so Mac was the first person who figured out why why can't he have all of them operate on the same bus? So that was the beginning, uh, that was the unibus. And uh, so Mac then invented the LXC central processing, uh, central bus, was the uh, fastest bus by a factor of 10 at that time. Uh, we could plug in um, 16 processors. Uh, all you need is one, but you can have up to 16. A um, lot of memory and and all the peripherals also plugged into the same bus, and uh, so we uh, innovated in a lot of uh, technologies. That was the uh, f first time um, a computer was built where the user did not know how many processors were inside the computer. 
So a, a single job did not run any faster, but if he had 10 jobs, and if he had two processes, it ran twice as fast. Or if he had eight processes, it ran eight, eight times as fast. And um, so the, and, and we built, uh, uh, but when you have these processes, high, sp high performance processes and the memory all built into the same bus, then you couldn't afford too much traffic on that bus. So you had to have a cache on the processor. But then if you have multiple processors, then these caches have to remain coherent um, between the, between the processors. So we were the first people to build a cache coherent bus. And a lot of it, and what is amazing is that uh, then next gen and then later on the Pentium architecture all learn from cache coherent buses and uh, multiple processes. Right. So and a lot so of on. innovation. A lot right. of innovation there. And I understand the business grew initially. Oh, the, so when we, uh, so our first processor was four times the 780. Uh, and then we could have up to 16 of them. And the very first year, uh, we sold $20 million worth of uh, computers. Uh, and the initial customers were three uh, um, uh, semiconductor companies. Um, actually, Doug bought the very first one for VLSI to do design rule checking. Uh, it so happened that for design rule checking, what you needed was not computing power as much as memory capacity, because if you can keep the entire design in, in memory, then you can do the ch checking a lot better than if you had to go get files from, from the disk. Yeah. So, we are so, encountering that even now. Yeah, you know. so you know, like uh, the Alexei machine could do uh, DRC in, um, in eight or 10 hours that used to take 10 days uh, on a VAC 780. And uh, so people were happy with that. They, uh, a lot of uh, VLS, LSI logic bought one of our machines. And uh, then the other one was in seismic exploration, where you know you, you get the seismic data, then you're looking for formations that would, that may have oil in it. So, so a lot of uh, exploration companies bought our thing. And then there was, during the Reagan time, um, the Star Wars, Martin Mareta, because there were any other computer that could keep track in real time that many objects uh, in the thing. So, so because of all of that, it grew really fast uh, the first year. And uh, then, so this was 84. And uh, then we built up, we thought, you know, if you could sell uh, $20 million for the computers with really no application software. And we had then the beginnings of all the applications, the seismic applications, the real time, um, and um, also the, the semiconductor very, uh, design tools. So we thought if we have all of those, then we should be able to sell at least twice as much the next year. And what we did not realize was that was probably the one of the biggest uh, downturns in, in the valley in 84. The semiconductor business went down, the seismic business went down. Um, people stopped uh, because of the government did not have the tax revenues. A um, lot of the Star Wars kind of funding went away. So we, we had rammed up to do uh, $40 million worth of, sell $40 million worth of computers. And remember those days, Everything was proprietary. It, uh, we built our um, uh, processes out of gate, uh, ECL gate arrays from Motorola, and um, the memory boards were proprietary. Uh, the disk drive controllers were proprietary. So when you want to build these things, then you had to order all those things uh, much ahead of time. So uh, to make a long story short, we ended up sending uh, uh, selling, I think, $25 million or something worth of computers in the following year. But we thought we'll sell 40 or 50, and we had spent the money to do the thing. And the venture capital business went down the tubes because the semiconductor business went down the tube. The 
the, the public markets uh, crashed. And so we just could not raise the money, even though we had uh, really terrific investors. We had Arthur Rock was an investor, Tata's were, uh, but Tata's did not have the resources outside India to, to help us and uh, help us to a significant degree. And uh, Bill Hambrick was on our board. And so then we decided to merge with uh, Trilogy, Gene Amdahl's company. And uh, it was an interesting co uh, combination where they had raised $300 million to do uh, wafer scale integration. And they had, I think, $100 million left over. And, uh, but no product. And we had a product, but no, no, uh, no money. Uh, but what we did not realize was that was uh, my first experience in, in virtual cash in the sense that even though they had $100 million, uh, the money was going out at the rate of five or six million dollars a month because of they had a, a semiconductor fab line that they had to maintain, and uh, so so we uh, trilogy ran out of money too. So so the only surviving thing of Alexi is a lot of technology, and the Tata Alexi. So that's uh, yeah. that's uh, that, I think that's what Breton was alluding to. Right. Yeah. Right. So that transition <coughs> into Tata Alexi then. So, that, so then I left uh, Alexi in, uh, after the merger with the Trilogy. Uh, they had an engineering, Carl Amdahl was the VP of engineering. And so I thought this was probably a good time for me to, to step away. And, um, and then I want to get back into the semiconductor business. That I loved, even though Alexi was the first computer company that I worked for. And then somebody was telling me the other day that uh, Kumar and I were the founders, very first Indian Indians who founded a computer company in America. And, and I think that is true. I should uh, figure out a way to double check that. I'm not aware of anybody in the, on the West Coast who founded a computer company. And uh, so, um, but I want to get back into the uh, microprocessor business. And, and the big thing those days was reduced instruction set computers. And, um, and you know what happens, like, like when you're in a startup, you have your blinders on and you have no idea what else may be going on in the microprocessor business because I was not involved in microprocessors at right. that time. And I was <clears throat> at Intel and this opportunity came to go to Sun, uh -huh. I mean, work on the Sun architecture. So same thing, you mm -hmm. know, sys to risk. So, um, so I decided that uh, I want to learn about reduce, reduced instruction set computers and as luck would have, it's Skip Stritter, who was the, one of the founders of MIPS and the architect of the 68000 at Motorola, um, was also my senior at his uh, no, I think he, we were classmates. So I called up Skip and I said, hey, Skip, I want to come and talk to you. You can tell me about the reduced instruction set computers. And as Skip was describing reduced instruction set and how you can build fast machines with that. And it, it suddenly occurred to me that, that that is definitely true. If he had only, at that time, the state of the art was 386, which was about 300,000 transistors. So what they were telling was absolutely true. If he had only 300,000 transistors to work with, reduced instruction set was the f fastest way of building computers within that computer uh, transistor budget. But I was thinking that hey, if he had another 200,000 transistors to work with, maybe you can translate an existing instruction set uh, in real time and then do reduced instruction set at the back end. And so that was the idea of next gen. And, uh, was and so that, that related to your thesis, the PhD thesis? Oh, the, it was thesis in the, the architecture was related to my thesis, pipelining, and so on and so forth. 
but uh, but this was really a, a sort of a, a business idea in the sense that um, um, all the available software ran on x86. Everybody had Sun and MIPS and all had, uh, even Intel had reduced instruction set to the extent that Intel felt that there was no future for x86. So they told Compaq and uh, in, uh, Olivetti that uh, they had 386. 386 is what made Compaq Compaq. And so they were, and Olivetti, Olivetti in Europe, they were the, they built the fastest machines in Europe and Compaq built the fastest machines, uh, all both based on 386. So um, Intel told Compaq and Olivetti that the next machine that they were working on, 486, was going to be the last x86 machine. And Intel is going to switch over to this thing called i960, which was a reduced instruction set machine. And, but then we came to the conclusion that we can do both. And uh, so we went over to uh, Compaq and Olivetti and told them about it. And they thought we were is a manner from heaven because for them, they were scared of uh, sun. So you did that under an NDA, non-disclosure agreement? I don't remember. I, I think in those days, nobody no, did NDA. Yeah, I I, I, VCs never did NDA. <laughs> okay. um, but we didn't think that it would, uh, well, you know, it, it is kind of interesting that, uh, um, um, so Rod Canyon was excited about it, uh, Bill Gates was, and Olivetti was, and um, and Rod then tried to put us in together with Intel, but Intel had no interest in it because they had decided that the risk was the way to go, and they had put all their thing on uh, uh, 960, then to follow on the Itanium it, or the one that HP used, and. Uh, so, so Compaq uh, and Olivetti funded us. So we were an unusual startup in the sense that our first two investors, other than the seed money, was uh, the two corporations, Compaq and Olivetti, and, uh, and then Mitsui uh, invested in us. Uh, that's how I met uh, Shima. And there was a... Um, and and Intel, uh, but Microsoft really helped us, but they were not, uh, they were sort of helped us behind the scenes. I mean, they gave us the, the source code for MS-DOS because you build a 360 uh, or x86, it doesn't matter how fast it is, if it doesn't boot up MS-DOS, it's not good. So we needed, uh, and you know, in those days, the microprocessor instruction sets were not as well defined as instruction sets were. Uh, so all the exceptions were not uh, properly specified. So, so for us, we need to, uh, if an exception occurred, it was easy to do the 386 instruction set, but what we didn't know is what happens if an exception happened, a, a divide by zero or something like that. Then what happened and what did the software, more important, what did the software depend on to happen? And uh, so we got the, uh, Bill Gates gave us the source code for um, MS-DOS. We had the, the crown jewels uh, at NextGen. And so we could run our simulations on that. Uh, I think we could uh, do, uh, if I remember it right, maybe 100 instructions a day or something like that in terms of simulation. Um, and, and they, uh, Intel had really no interest, but Intel never gave us any trouble in the sense that they recognized, they knew what we were doing because we went and gave a presentation to them. Um, and so I always tell people that we were the only company that, that ever competed with Intel that wasn't sued by Intel. And uh, so um, David House knew what we were doing. David was running the microprocessor group at that time. Um,
and then uh, then another thing that happened to us is that for we didn't realize it at that time uh, the people who other than Intel people who had the best processing technology was IBM at that time so we had IBM do the manufacturing for it so one story I really don't know is why Intel didn't sue us is that IBM was my, my manufacturing these processes for us. So probably IBM had the right to manufacture Intel, pa you know, using Intel patents, which they probably had a cross license. I, I still don't know what, but you know, but I think Intel also respected us uh, because we were really bringing new technology into the marketplace. And uh, then we went, uh, we went public and then AMD bought us after, after we went public, but interesting side story was that uh, AMD paid us $850 million, which was a lot of money, um, in 1992, nine, 94. And, uh, and then they turned around and sued Intel for patent infringement on the Pendium, because Pendium then followed a lot of our architectural innovations, bus following, um, uh, you know, uh, decomposing, the 386 instructions into reduced instruction sets and so on and so forth. And they ended up uh, settling with Intel for $2 billion or something. So that turned out to be a, a great return on investment on their part. So on NextGen, who was the president? You were running it? Or? I was the president. Okay. Uh, and then um, f uh, maybe five or six years in, uh, Atik had joined us from VLSI. Yes. Uh, Atik was in charge of uh, design automation, and um, and one of the challenges of uh, laying out the Pendium chip was really it was a design automation challenge too. So we felt that Atik would be really helpful. So he joined as a VP of engineering, and then uh, two years later, uh, ninety two, he became the president, and I became the chairman, um, and then ninety four we went public. And then, which in hindsight turned out to be a fortunate thing for me because I had no requirement to go to AMD. I think since he was the president of uh, NextGen, he had the obligation, which turned out to be a good thing for him because he became the president of AMD, did really well. Right, right. So I remember from a technology, you mentioned IBM was the foundry. Uh -huh. uh, I remember, uh, Atik coming to me at Cyprus uh -huh. to look at the Cyprus scene. Oh, we tried to do that with Cyprus yeah, too. I remember, I remember that. that. Yeah. So in the end, uh, they stayed with IBM, or who was the foundry? Oh, then when then AMD, AMD bought it, yeah, AMD bought, then they yeah. started doing it. But until then, it was still IBM. IBM, okay. yeah. Okay. So um, that's very interesting. And then. Um, so talking about your career, so then after you left uh, when AMD bought it, yeah. what was the next step that you did? The next step was was uh, was interesting because uh, the the company went public. Uh, we uh, uh, for the first time uh, ninety four was when uh, Diva and I were without debt. Uh, or some spare cash in the bank, and uh, then um, in it was a long. The LXC was from 1979 to 85. That is six years, and NextGen was from 86 through 92 or six years. That 12 years of startups, and uh, so I really wanted to take some time off and. Uh, and around the same time, Joe Risi, uh, after NextGen, I start after LXE, I started NextGen. Joe joined uh, Matrix Partners as a partner, and uh, and it's for, he did really well. His first two investments were um, um, Veritas, a software company, who did became then Semantic after that. Um, and then um, um, the flash, uh, the name will come to me, um, not Cinetech, uh, 
well, the name will come to me. And uh, so, you know, his first two investments were just great. He made a lot of, uh, I mean, he made a lot of money for the partnership. And, uh, but he also had decided, he had by that time, um, eight years of venture capital, I think same time, same duration that I was at NextGen. And he was thinking of doing something on his own investments. So Joe and I started doing um, a sort of angel investments in the 96 time frame. So uh, our, our investment model was that we will find something interesting, a good group of founders, and if they can do the first product or proof of concept in uh, three or four million dollars, then we said, okay, we will put together that money. And then once the, the concept is proved, proven, then we'll go to the venture capital people for the expansion money. So that was our model. And, and it all worked out really well because in the 96 to 2000 time frame, uh, the VCs were not interested in funding a uh, small startup. They were all wanted to do dot com. And so, so if, you had a, if you had a clever piece of software uh, or uh, uh, a design that required two or three or four million dollars, they had really no interest in, in funding that. So we funded uh, uh, the very first um, uh, synthesizable core company, uh, virtual chips. Uh, they had a model of a, a, a bus interface for the PC bus, IBM PC bus, PCI bus. And so they will sell that synthesizable core to people who want to do logic, but they wanted something to interface to the bus directly. Um, and they got, it was a great exit. Uh, Rajan Raghavan, who founded that company, uh, got bought by Phoenix Technology, which was the BIOS company. Um, and then uh, we funded uh, Postex, which was a uh, Encryption. uh, encrypted email company. Then, uh, uh, then a, a sort of reverse of virtual chip was a company called Real Chip, where the idea was instead of synthesizable core, we'll make real cores and then put them together uh, for for big designs. Uh, that that didn't work out really well, um, but Postex got bought by uh, Cisco. They're still using some of that technology, um, and then along the way, um, the most interesting startup we did was a company called Liquid Robotics. Uh, which was invented by a person called Roger Heim. Um, and the invention was doing a marine robot where the entire propulsion was waves going up and down, and which provided the forward thrust. Uh, so all the mechanical power was generated from waves. And then um, they had a solar cell uh, at the top for for communicating with satellites and GPS systems and so on, and uh, it's a, it turned out to be a very successful product. Uh, initially, uh, the the people who bought them were all intelligence agencies, CIA. So this is a non-profit. Uh, uh, oh, so the non-profit is uh, I tell you the non-profit part. The 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 initial. A part of that research was funded by a foundation that Joe set up called Jupiter Foundation. So Jupiter Foundation funded Roger for 12 months, 15 months um, to do the to develop this technology. And then this is purely from the love of nature, or well, well it it uh, it started in a. Um, in a very interesting way, Joe has a, a house on Puaco, which is a beach in the Big Island, and uh, and that's on the migration path of whales. And he got interested in listening to whales, and but so but he needed something that he could moor in the in the ocean, not uh, close to the uh, beach, because they had. Uh, this thing called snapping shrimp, 
which created a lot of static, so you couldn't um, record the whale sounds properly. So he was looking for a solution that record whale sound, but in the middle of the ocean, or mid at least uh, far the away whales. from the snapping shrimp. Yeah. And, uh, and so he had, um, first he, uh, he had a moored buoy, uh, which was uh, moored in, in, in the ocean uh, with a chain and weight and you know, the traditional way. Um, and every time uh, it lasts for three or four months and every time there is a big swell, then the chain breaks. And, and then he has to go looking for the buoy. Fortunately, he could because it had a GPS system on it. And uh, so he was, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how these great inventions start because he was uh, then uh, postulating, it wouldn't be nice to have something stationary in the ocean that is not uh, moved down, you know, that can stay on the ocean floor, on the ocean surface, but be stationary. So that was his thought because of he got tired of chasing his buoy uh, after it get uh, broken off. And uh, so I, w one of his, uh, uh, Roger Haim was his friend's son and uh, was a um, robotics engineer from Stanford. And uh, so I'm, I bet it was a, a picnic in his backyard or whatever. He, he talked to Roger about, you know, it would be great to invent something that can stay. Uh, and, and then, you know, it, 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 it becomes a, a very challenging problem because uh, you cannot have a, it cannot be battery operated. Um, it cannot be solar power because you cannot generate enough power to, to sort of overcome wave thrust so that he can stay stationary. So uh, then Roger came up with this design, which was uh, a two-part design, a float and a, and an eight-foot chain uh, with the submarine sort of structure at the end of that eight-foot chain. And it had fins, passive fins, uh, spring-loaded. And so what happens is that when the waves go up and down, the float go up and down, which will drag the, this uh, submarine portion up and down, and when, because of then the, because the water pressure or the water column, the um, the fins go, uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, we'll have a, a up and down motion, which creates the forward thrust. So that was so the the waves going up and down created the forward thrust. That was the theory, uh, and then uh, they made it work. And uh, uh, it was just an amazing piece of invention because um, normally any kind of um, diesel-powered or battery-powered thing that stays in the ocean, um, you need enormous amount of energy uh, to overcome the waves. In this particular case, the waves po provided the thrust. And, and the way then they decided, so the, but it cannot stand still, it always went straight, uh, uh, forward, so to speak. And the way they made it stand still is they put a rudder on it and made it go around in circles. So the circle was like a 50 foot circle, but in ocean terms, it's a pinpoint. Because if you have a, uh, a ocean floor that is two miles down, you know, the best you can do, even if you change something down, you can keep three, a three mile radius. And so the fact that you can keep a 50 foot radius was, you know, was pinpoint. And uh, so they, um, and at that point, uh, Joe, Joe wanted me to get involved with it because we want to sort of make India a commercial operation. And so, so I joined, and so then we spun off uh, this company called Liquid Robotics from Jupiter Foundation as a as a standalone entity got it funded, and uh, initial customers were all intelligence agencies. Uh, well, Joe used it to listen to the uh, to the waves, <laughs> and uh, but intelligence agencies were interested because they can have now something 
that they can um, without you know it doesn't have a motor so it didn't make any uh, sound prints or voice prints and so nobody can detect it and um, they uh, uh, but it 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 did like uh, one and a half or two miles an hour two two knots an hour but but what they could do is, if they want to monitor some area, they could drop it out of a plane, monitor it, and then bring it back. So you can swim home, so to speak. And even though it took two months to come home, it didn't matter because the, the, the mission was done. And, uh, and it has gone from here to Japan and back. It has circumnavigated uh, the Earth. Um, it, now it has commercial applications for... Um, um, not only intelligence agencies, but for seismic exploration, offshore oil exploration. Um, you can use it, you can literally put a, uh, a picket fence around a country. Uh, you know, you can put these things in, like in, 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 the, in the ocean and decide what crosses it. Uh, people so use it for- a lot of data gathering. Yeah, drug interdictions and so on and so forth. And it, the company did well, and then last year, uh, which was my last startup, uh, Boeing bought them, so I am no more in, in, involved in startups. I am involved in uh, Deepa's book project. <laughs> yeah, that is excellent. So, uh, you know, I noticed that there's been an intersection with Joe Rizzi. Yeah. So maybe you can say a few words about him and his role in affecting your life or whatever. Well, it's, it so happened that um, I have um, I have spent more time with Joe than anyone else in the world, including Deepa. Um, I know Joe before that, and we worked together. Uh, we started one company together. We uh, invested in companies together. Um, he's one of the uh, cleverest people that I have. Uh, clever in a, I mean that in a in a very high common. A lot of us are intelligent, but some people are just clever. You know, they they can think about things that uh, uh, just off the charts that somebody would never th think of. I know that you know this at. Uh, um, uh, in uh, in uh, one of the problems with programmable memories was that you we blew the fuse, the fuse link, and the problem was some of them grew back or settled back, and uh, and Intercell had this thing where um, it was. Uh, what they call avalanche induced migration aim, which was uh, the problem that we were all sort of uh, afraid of is how do you either electrostatic energy, you know, swap uh, shorts the input input pad. So we used to protect it, and the Joe used that as a way to to program and to make that thing happen in a controlled way, so that you can program a bit that will stay programmed. Forever. So, so that's that's one idea. This uh, 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 Roger invented the uh, uh, the the, tech, uh, the liquid robotics wave glider, but it was Joe who asked the question, who posed the question. I would never think of it. First of all, I I would think of you know who the hell wants to listen to whales, you know, or, or you know. Uh, somebody to take it as a hobby and then worry about then you have all the static in your sound recording then your first is uh, approach was okay I'll filter it out but the problem was you couldn't filter it out it was so random and uh, so his attention to detail yeah and I remember the criticism of Shep Hume yeah was that he had great ideas but he once implementation came he was not interested yeah but Shep was a very clever guy too. He was also good. Yeah, and uh, you know one of the uh, uh, the privileges of working in the in the semiconductor business or the two startups that I was involved in, um, these guys are. Um, see, I look at myself uh, not as an inventor. I look at 
myself as an editor. You know, I can have really smart people working in my group, and I can sort of synthesize their ideas or, or pick a direction. One, uh, ideas rarely originated uh, from me. The, the, the two ideas, interestingly enough, that originated from me was, you know, why can't we uh, make Intel's instruction set into reduce instruction set? And this whole idea of why can't we have processes that we can plug into your bus. So those two things did occur to me, but 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 then a lot of inventions needed to make it into, and, and it was Len and Kumar and um, uh, Mac McFarlane um, and Nick Tredenick at, uh, at um, NextGen, who Nick in, uh, did the circuit design for the 68,000, with Skip Stritter, interestingly enough. Skip was architect, Nick was the circuit designer. Um, so y you have, uh, you interact with all these bright people and, and you feel so fortunate uh, to do that. And it, it's a privilege to be around. Yes, I, I feel that, I mean, even the project we were doing, the CMOS microprocessor, the first yeah. CMOS microprocessor, yeah. and how it affected the, you know, Intel and all yeah. that, you know, yeah. and, uh, it's amazing. So, so you know, I I feel that uh, it's a I I lived a, a privileged life, uh, but uh, I always think um, one of the uh, when I was uh, when Mitsui was uh, an investor in um, in NextGen when I was in Japan they took me to see the senior Matsushita who started, it's sort of like going to see J.R.D. Tata. And uh, uh, I mean in turn, but it was it's two generations before that that Tata started, but J.R.D. made Tata's into what the modern Tata and, and then uh, Ratan built on that. The, so, so, you know, here I am sitting in front of this 85 year old person and I'm trying to make conversations. So one of the uh, things I asked him was, uh, "How do I? How do you hire people?" And he thought about it for less than a second, and he said, "Oh, I just hire the lucky ones, you know." And and I think luck plays a really important part in in one's life. And uh, if I had not met uh, Ed Davidson at, at Stanford. Or Joe uh, at Intercel, um, or Deva in, in an accidental meeting, my life would have been very, very different. So, so even though I had done well in my life, uh, I always think of it could have been something different. You know, a lot of people paved the path. Or if my dad had not uh, talked his grandmother into giving him her jewelry, our life would have been different. And, so you yeah. raised a good family. Uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about your boys. And uh, the, the boys had, uh, it, it looks like it skips a generation in terms of careers. When I, my, one of my favorite uh, experiences was when Aheen, our younger one, was seven or uh, maybe 10 years old. Uh, they had in Portola Valley uh, Middle School, they had a career day. And so the thing is that, so the parents come, the kids are there, and so the teacher will ask the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for me, the most amazing thing was very, uh, actually nobody in that class uh, wanted to be something because their dad was some a doctor or an engineer or a mom was a doctor or dad was a lawyer, it always a grandfather. It was always a, my, I want to be a doctor because my grandfather is a doctor. And, uh, and it does, it does happen, clearly happened in our case because my dad was a lawyer. There are nine siblings in my family, uh, five sisters and four brothers. None of us became lawyers. Um, but there are at least four grandchildren who are lawyers and doing really well. So Sunil is a lawyer, the older one. Uh, he works for Google. Um, but he came to Google in a, in a very roundabout way. He was a, 
he did law he was very interested in environmental law and he worked for a, a non profit called nature conservancy he was the uh, policy person for california um and then um when we started uh, or when we were part of getting uh, liquid robotics off the ground he joined liquid robotics as the lawyer and and the reason for that we thought there were uh interesting legal issues to be looked at because you know we are crossing international boundaries and you're collecting data across international boundaries and and a lot of countries have even though you have 12 12 miles worth of uh, the boundary but a lot of people can claim 200 miles of economic zone so the question was can you go to somebody's economic zone and collect data you know who who is so and and we also thought that the initial applications for uh, wave gliders or liquid robotics would be uh, ocean monitoring um monitoring of islands monitoring of uh, ocean life marine life so we thought is background in um, um in in conservation and environment would be of use even though he had no background in uh, uh, um in robotics in the ocean or now the question is that what happens if uh, a ship runs over it with nothing n- nothing more in most cases nothing would happen but he could we could get uh, intertwined in the in the in the propeller of a ship and then the ship gets damaged who is responsible for it so not that he had any experience in that but nobody had any experience in that but he was a smart lawyer so so th- so for me that was a really terrific experience where i uh, worked with sunil uh, as we were all learning all the com- complexities of m- maritime law robotics uh, you know the one thing that we, i learned is that all the maritime law is written about around a concept called a captain so there is a captain so the captain is responsible for the men and the ship and the cargo so so now uh, a wave glider a robot does something stupid now who is the captain is the captain the guy at who who is uh, uh, you know uh, controlling the the glider or in some cases the glider is controlling itself so is it the person who wrote the software and so on and so forth so you know so the interesting uh, cha- uh, legal questions and and so he did a great job there and uh, then he ended up joining uh, google's cloud division and uh, and there also um, he is in their uh, ai part of google uh and there are interesting challenges in the in the ai one of the uh, uh last year or so one of the more interesting uh things that he ran into is that they they put out a a facial recognition software as part of their cloud offerings and somebody showed him and the face of a black guy and the software identified it as a chimpanzee or something like that, which made all the internet things and so on so you, you get into challenges like that you know and so ai is uh, uh is a blessing but it's also a challenge for us you know, especially uh we look at america in terms of the employment and the opportunities for the less educated people right and yeah in fact i was going to ask you about the current challenges that you see and how one should yeah, address it i think it. i think machine learning is, and ai all yeah, of that yeah you know for me the uh, um trump get elected was a really a wake up call uh, for me in the sense that um i i think uh a lot of us should take responsibility for that to have for that to have happened in the sense that um we all believed in trade which is all tr- which is good uh, you know the, the overall wealth of the company uh, or the nation goes up with international trade but what we forget is that there are a lot of people who get hurt 
and and the people here i- including me you and me and deepa and yeah uh, you know we get all the benefits of the trade but none of the d- disadvantage and so i think in that respect this has been a wake up call uh, i think uh, you know if you if you look at um, the industrial industries that the trade helps the most are all uh, technology for sure because we sell more stuff than we buy in technology um and uh, pharmaceutical uh hollywood um uh, the uh, finance financial services so if you look at these are the four sectors where most of the senior people are democrats so you would think that they would have thought through the second order effects of free trade and we did not and and i think it has been a it has been a wake up call and in a funny kind of way it is happening in india now because uh, india became a middle class country because of technology offshoring but lot of the now the lower levels of that are getting automated so a lot of indians in that sort of coming up to the middle class are getting laid off so it will be interest so you could have the same sort of reaction in india that we had in detroit with the with the auto workers and you know what brought them to the middle class is sort of now pushing so them so as now. you mentioned certainly ai is causing a lot of uh, discourse in yeah. the in the world about le- you know the future uh, employment issues that yeah. unemployment issues uh so certainly something food for thought there's um, well, it really is and i i think the fact that all of us are thinking about uh there are very few things uh, personally speaking uh that we should be grateful to trump for but i think this is one he made us think about it nobody else had obama for sure had not um and uh, even though i admire obama a lot but i think what happens is that we all live in a world of our own and we don't know what people in Kentucky or Ohio right, are right. going around. It's interesting that in my conversation with Ratan Tata in, yeah. in the conversation I uh, there was something that happened uh, at the time when the computers being introduced in India. Uh-huh. And there was a reaction. Yeah. They said we're going to lose um, you know yeah. em- employment and his dad wrote an article because he represented ILO uh-huh. uh India in right. the ILO uh-huh. and he wrote an article uh defending why computers would be good for the country right. and uh, it turned out that it you know it turned out okay for India at yeah. least for for that because it just was a growing thing it actually helped the country right but the same kind of discourse can happen on the ai yeah front. and and there are some people you know this is something i really admire about tatas there are certain things you know automation puts people out of work but that's what happened with their steel plants you know the they want to automate their steel plant because they couldn't compete in the international market which then put a lot of their uh, people in jamshedpur out of work but what they did is that they told all the people who, are, who they're putting out of work that their salaries are going to be paid even though they are not working at uh, tisco till they retire and uh, and it turned out to be in hindsight turned out to be a good thing because they made more money automating the things and and these people with their salaries could go do something hopefully they did something on their own i think for me that is an example of a more forward looking way of dealing with automation is we need to be sensitive to the people that it is negatively impacting uh, who in turn that, that negative impact provides more wealth to us so to speak whether it comes from the stock market or our own um, uh, businesses and right so in terms of challenges you know certainly you know we are talking about the computational world and yeah. the computer world and software but the biology in the case of biology and the brain research and the whole medical profession and how to improve the lives of people oh, there's a lot of interesting things happening it is and it is a uh, it is a problem in a in a in a in a sense in the sense that as i was telling you my my retrieval time is getting slower and 
so you i'm 71 and and i'm healthy uh, and so then you wonder in 10 years i may continue to be healthy but there may be aspects of the quality of my life it may not be a, a, that interesting interesting a life so i think that's going to be a big challenge and i think these modern medicines are going to make us age Prolo long prolong life, life but not necessarily a quality quality of life, of life so yeah. there's a whole discourse happening in yeah. that world as well that yeah, uh, yeah. so i wanted to uh, unless you want to talk some more about this subject uh, we want to transition to what your recommendation would be to the future generation in all aspects whether what kind of careers to choose or how to uh, ser help the community or the uh, you know, world around us. Yeah. I think uh, the, I am jealous of the kids who grow up in America, you know, in the sense that there are no pressures on them to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. Uh, I remember one of the first letters that I wrote home when I came to Stanford was, you know, smart kids take English at Stanford, or graduate in history, or whatever, and uh, and and see that world has gone away too. Because my first job out of Stanford uh, was uh, at National was making thousand um, dollars a month, that uh, not even thousand dollars a month, ten thousand a year, and. But you could be a high school teacher, I make 7,000 or something, which wasn't a bad deal because you got three months off. And, but now the de delta is 150,000 and maybe 60,000. So, so the, the opportunities that people had in America of choosing one's own path may not be as readily available now than it was 40 years ago, when I, or 50 years, almost 50 years ago when I came. Um, so people need to be uh, sort of career conscious, but within that, um, I think you have, you have a lot of freedom. Um, uh, you don't have the family pressures to follow the family business or become a lawyer or to join the Indian Administrative Service or anything like that. So I think they are, they are a privileged bunch. And they, uh, at least our two sons, um, we are really proud of who, uh, they are now uh, 43 and 39. Um, the 39-year-old, uh, he and his wife are expecting the first child in, uh, in another three months, uh, first grandchild. Um, they really done. Uh, they they done us proud, and we are really proud of the peop the the men they have grown up to be. You know, and 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 Diva and I talk about this in the sense that the way they deal with their partners are different than. Most Indians, including me, uh, deal with their spouses. Uh, most men. Um, uh, there is a there is a uh, uh, you know you, you sort of assumed in the old days that you know women had a place and you know the man is the boss of the household and so on and so forth. The, but it's, it's really amazing to see these kids. They, they treat each other equal. There are no expectations on who is going to cook the dinner, you know, those kinds of things. Minor things, but they are big things, I think. And uh, so, so I enjoy watching them. And, uh, and I think their kids will have even a more equal uh, life. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you.